Why the fuck was my cup so little? Yeah, that's like, yo, some racism, you got a bigger dog. cup. Yeah, you got yeah, a bigger yeah, cup. This is yo, like and I got them, and I got a fancy ass cube, dog. I yo, know this is, this is like cube, one of them dog. cups that they eat the fucking softball egg out of. The fucking <laughs> softball ostrich egg. This is one of them fucking egg cups. Like, <laughs> yeah, we gotta spark this one right now, dude. We gotta spark this one now. Dropping the first two episodes of The Real Ones, and today we feature a city that is right in the center of my heart, city of Baltimore. This episode features my friend Dee Watkins. Dee is an unbelievably talented writer. He's a professor at the University of Baltimore, and he's the editor-at-large for Salon.com. Dee grew up in the heart of Baltimore, right in its infamous east side. He was in the drug game, he was on the streets, and he's made it his life's work to examine his experience, talk about his come up, talk about his life, including his interactions with the police. I first got into contact with Dee the second I finished reading his unbelievable article, Baltimore's Most Hated Cop and Me. I read that article and I had to reach out. Since then, we've worked together on an upcoming TV miniseries set in Baltimore. You know, I was talking on the way up here when I was driving over and like my shit with you is, is, is crazy, man, because I read that Salam piece that you wrote uh, most hated cop, you know, and that shit just blew my mind, you know, and I, and, and, you know, I reached out to you and I told you how much I loved it. And, you know, then everything kind of came full circle. You told me you were working on this show. Then we ended up working on this show together, like a year later, whatever. Yeah, but, no, I, yo, I saw you playing that, but I couldn't slide David. Like I couldn't slide David. D d d listen, man, that like, so a hundred percent, everything happened. Like, like, I hate that. Well, everything fucking happened. Like that, that's some like, no, fucking, but it's like, some real it's shit. It's some though. real shit, dude. It's like, as much as you want to fight that shit like everything does happen for a reason but you know i read that and i had never been excited by an article like i've been excited by that and then i took a deep dive you know i read the cook up first and 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 i told you man like you are the most exciting author like i love your work man i love you as a writer and i feel like the piece you know clearly showed you know authenticity and all the like bullshit words that people use the grit and that it was like lived in that you experienced but the, the thing that kind of like blew me away um, was the empathy. If you could, just because I don't know, you know, how many of the people who are going to be watching this, like, no, will you just kind of like walk me through like what that, what that piece was? Yeah, Like absolutely. explain it through, explain it for us. You know, the funny thing about it is when I wrote the cook up, I couldn't write that piece. Why? I couldn't, because I'm a whole different person. When I wrote the cook up, I didn't have the ability to consider a perspective that was outside of my own social context. I didn't have it. Wow. It wasn't in me. Yeah. It wasn't in me. Let, I me tell you, I, well, yeah, let me yeah. tell you how it is over here. Nah, how yeah. about fuck you yeah, is straight my, up. was my mentality straight because up. that's what the world taught me. I've had some experiences. I had some nice dinners. I had some fucking all types of red duck meat and lamb chops and straight fucking up. buttered down, <laughs> fucking like some wild shit. Yeah. So I've been some places, right? Yeah. So I had some experiences. But the essay, the essay that you read, and it's crazy how, and we're not going to get on this aloof, goofy fucking universe, like crystals and fucking stars shit. Yeah. You know, I got a quartz. Like yeah. we're not, <laughs> yeah. we're not, we're not gonna do that. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it a bean. It was, the, it was an art. So the New York, a guy from the New York Times was like, "Yo, we want something from you on this, right?" He was like, "Yo, I found you." He's like, "Yo, I read the B side, um, back in whatever, whatever." That's my first book, and he was like. I know that you can kill something on a gun trace task force in Baltimore. I'm coming to you. And I'm like, yo, bet, let's do something. And he was like, now, nah, like, come to New York. I want you to come to New York. Let's sit down. Let's spend a day together. So I'm like, fuck it. Let's do it. So I get to New York and we hanging out and we shooting the shit. And he's like, I'm pitching him. And he's like, yo, give me a day to go to my pitch meeting tomorrow. We're going to make it happen, right? So I'm like, cool. The next day, he's like, um, Yo, there's another guy in Baltimore who has a story coming, and it's not like your story, but he writes for us all the time, and the editor outranks me, so we gotta take his story. And he's like, um, how about you write something for our recommendation page, mm -hmm. right? So I was like, damn, because this was gonna be a 3,000 word story, yeah. and it was gonna like pay some pretty good money. How many words is it? It's like 10,000. Yeah. But this is what happened. This is this is like how shit just works out. Yeah. I love the New York Times. I love New York Times Magazine. I love the readership. I love all of that. But I didn't get the opportunity. So my my I got a, a friend in Baltimore named Will Hilton who writes for New York Times all the time as well. 
And he was like, yo, why don't you just take it to Highline? So I'm like, okay, that's cool. So he sent me the number to the guy from Highline and he was like, yo, not only will I pay you more than what they was gonna pay you, fuck 3,000 words, you can give me 10. And, and has, was anything written yet or was just the treatment of what you were going to Well, do? I was already going to court cases like because I just like to go to court. Yeah. I just like, yo, going to court yeah. is wild fun when, is, when right? like you're not when the you one. Ain't, it's when you're not, straight when, up. When you've it's ever not, been on that your side, future. Straight up. When dude. it's not your future. This is why people like hood movies so much. They're like, yo, yeah. watching this hood shit is wild when yeah. like I don't gotta fucking duck the bullets and shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, straight you know, up. It's like a fucking thrill. Yeah. So I'm in, so I'm in court. I'm in court like like um filming, but well, not filming, but taking notes. And um, monitoring things, and you know, looking looking in the eyes of, of people, and just trying to see what was happening. And the opportunity went from it went from being like a um, seven thousand dollar gig to like a twenty five thirty thousand dollar gig because I got denied, right? So this is why you don't really get up, like go crazy when you don't get what you want because it's always like some other there's something else waiting and you might not know. So Will hooked me up with this place called Highline, and the Highline editor was with it. And he was turned up. Like he, you know, we 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 spoke on the phone for like supposed to be we booked out like 45 minutes to speak after like three minutes. He's mm -hmm. like, fuck you, get out the phone, go to work. Yeah. So I'm like, yo, you know what? I actually don't want to talk. Yeah. I actually want to go to work. Yeah. So yeah, I, so, yeah. so I went to work. And the essay was about how I met this police officer at three different phases in my life. First time I met him, I was young, I was playing ball. I I thought I had a future playing ball, like maybe not like not an NBA future. I knew I wasn't that good. I was wasn't tall enough. I'd already been shot. Like it was just too many things working against me. But I thought I had like a I love playing basketball, right? I love I knew I was gonna do something around basketball. And he came, they came on the court and they made all of us lie on the ground. And this particular day, I didn't feel like laying on the ground because I wasn't playing ball. So I had my good clothes on and I wasn't hustling. So why do I gotta go through this? And he's talking his shit and I say something back and he kicks me in my ribs. He kicked the shit out of me, right? Yeah. Like he kicked, he kicked the shit out of me. And um, you know, I never forgot him. And then the second time I come across this guy is now I'm not, I'm still down, I'm still down, I'm from down the hill in East Baltimore. But this particular time, I'm moving up the hill and I'm by Broadway and Dickey Land, or I'm or I'm over the projects. Um um, someone said housing projects. So now I'm coming at him, I'm meeting him in, in a different capacity. And he's still talking shit, he's still running his mouth, but now he's he's patting pockets. Oh, you got the little 300, 400 on you there, yeah, let me get that. And me, I'm like, yo, you telling me, you take this $300 and whatever's on me, and I don't gotta go to Central Booking and sit in that cold ass cell, that fucking piece of bologna and that fucking soft, untoasted toast and you know that powder egg shit, guess what, I'm good. <laughs> Take the three hundred. I, I, you know, I was gonna freak out. I was fucking off anyway. I was, I was blowing money anyway. Take it, right? So I met him under that capacity. Then I cleaned my life up, and I'm not in the streets no more. I'm a good guy now. I'm a solid citizen. I'm trying to find fucking um, a living wage. All that shit. Um, what the fuck is Joe Buttons? Joe Biden? I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I'm, trying <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to fucking find like a living wage and shit. Yeah. I'm trying to work, and my young boy is taking over the neighborhood on the rap tip. Like, and he's taking over the whole East Baltimore. Moose, young Moose, and yeah. Now he's, and now Moose is banging in West Baltimore. Now Moose banging throughout the city. Now Moose is banging, he's doing his thing. And this cop already locked Moose up multiple times. One incident, he locked up Moose's mom. He said, oh, you the mother. Boom, slam on the car. Throw and the he locked him up because Moose was rapping Locked him up, him. but he locked him up because Moose started getting famous on the rap tip. His name started ringing bells and he started shooting videos. And when he shot the video, uh, I believe it was for the song Posted, he had like some props in the video and he locked them up saying that, the, you know, these were like real items when there was no way to prove it. And Moose is like, yo, I'm dropping videos that get a million hits on YouTube. So why in the fuck would I sell a drug? It doesn't make any sense. But Herschel worked really hard to try to end his career. So I'm like, yo, not only did this guy fuck me over before I ever stepped in the streets, fuck me over when I was in the streets and I expect that, but then he's fucking the young boys over who was trying to like, 
like help a, a, a young fledgling art community come together. Because when you rap, you paying an engineer. You might be paying the person who do this on a stylist tip. You're paying the person to you know to uh to put the CD packages together and all that. Like you're paying like you know the girl singing on a hook. Like there's all of these local artists working together, yeah. using pooling their resources and money to try to create a movement. And you got this cop who's out here that the city is not only paying his salary, but they already forked out a quarter million dollars in misconduct settlements. So you're not only fucking the residents, but you're fucking the taxpayers um, who are residents as well. So I wanted to tell that story and I wanted to just really, really, really like break it down because it just gave me, um, it gave me an opportunity to show how small Baltimore is. Mm. This guy grew up a mile away from me, <clears throat> had a whole different reality. And I thought it was like phenomenal that he started off as just like, some regular white guy with limited talents <laughs> and you know but became a cop and like him becoming a cop to his family was like how a good family would feel when their kid becomes like the doctor that cures a rare disease right. they were like oh my god you made it right and like i started out in the street and then i ended up being a scholars professor and then he ended up going to federal prison and i thought the parallels was just like some shit that you know you did one of them situations where the jokes kind of write themselves. So I kind of like, I felt like that was, I felt like that was like the type of situation that I wanted to create. And um, it fucking, I mean, it worked like, you know, I mean, I met you, but then like, yo, we like my, my manager, it was like maybe like 20 people banging his line down trying to buy that and yeah. like some really, really big names. Yeah. But like the, the you stuck out to me because I'm like, yo, this is, you know, this guy is like, he's just a, a fucking, like, he's sterile. Mm. I ain't know about the boxing. I ain't mm. know about none of that shit. Mm. Like, I didn't mm. know you was from D.C. Mm. I was like, mm. yo, he's just a, a just a good person. I, man, I, I I appreciate that, man. But, like, I, I tell you, just through the art, man, through what you created, you, you know, I was, I, you know, again, man, it's like, that's that's what we're looking for. Like, what you, you know, like, that's the best thing that art can do. Just excite you, make you, it just open up a whole new window of, of, of a way of looking at things. And I think sometimes the best thing that art can do is it can put a name, it can, it can, it can locate something that you've only felt in your heart, but you never had it really worked out. And the thing that, like, I, I will say really hit me, and I watched the documentary uh, this morning as well, and, and, and you said something in there that, 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 that reflected it. Is you know you had hate for this dude, and 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 justifiably so. Like he kicked you when you were when you were young. But then like the thesis of the thing and what and what what I was so taken with is you were like, if I don't even try to understand him or why he where he come from or why he's making the decisions that he did, then why should anybody under try to understand me? Because you fucked up as well. That just resonated with me in like a, 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 a in a very pure way. Let uh, me let me say this. A lot of big names hit me up, and you are you are a big name too. But who you who you were, in our conversation, just had more weight. It just had more weight, and I, I think that shit is important because if a person has a lot of success and is like a horrible motherfucker, then you're never gonna kind of get what you want out of that situation anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we really need to think about that. We need sure. to think about that because we jump. You know, on oh my God, you know the guy who made rah, 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 wants to yeah. fuck with you. Yeah. But if that guy's a dickhead, then you kind of not really gonna get what you want. But I, I'll say this: so I I have a daughter. Um, she's one years old. She'll be two in January, mm. and I know that if my story ends in Baltimore and we stay in Baltimore, and she goes through the schools and she goes through whatever programs and she does whatever she's whatever she's into. In her life, somebody's gonna stop her and they're gonna say, Yo, your father gave books to my school. Your father visited my school. Your father was the person who helped my whatever get started their writing career. He got them an agent. He put money in their pocket. He he we was on the air mattress. He bought us the bed with the box spring and the, and the yeah. fucking prostopedic, all that shit. Like, yo, he's that nigga. Like, yo, yeah. I love him. Like, your father changed my whole shit. And then I know that somebody's gonna be like, yo, your father fucking bought the violence from down the hill to the projects. This gun plays here because of what him and his friends did. They fucked the neighborhood up. They did terrible shit. He doesn't deserve anything. And 
God willing, if I'm around, I'm going to have to explain that to her. Mm. I'm going to have to tell her, like, yo, the stuff that I do, a lot of it is a result of some of not just the pain I went through, but the pain I caused. Okay. And then there's a healing process wow. that I'm going to be going through for the rest of my fucking life. So get off your high horse and get off your, oh, my God, oh, he's a black literary. Where we're at. Fuck that shit. Because you have to, I have to say that I'm not perfect. I've been a bad person. I've done some horrible things and I've tried my best to make amends for that. And I know I'm going to be working on that shit for the rest of my life. Some shit that I did as a teenager in my early 20s is some shit I'm going to be trying to fix when I'm fucking 60, 70, 80 years old. And you have to understand that. So yeah, I think this guy has been a bad person. I think this guy never really understood the error of his ways. But I also understand that nobody, especially me, has the right or the power to throw this person away. Mm. Because we don't solve the fucking problem by saying, oh my God, this is the bad group. This is the good group. This group, we don't solve problems like that. We solve problems by saying, oh, okay, he's a victim of a certain culture, just like me. Let's understand the culture that he comes from and let's try to let him know what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. And then we start there. When, when you say you're a, a victim of culture, can you tell me about that? Like kind of walk me through uh, a victim of culture? Yeah, you know, I grew up um, in the murder unit. Um, I, I, I grew up in, you know, gunplay was, gunplay was, it was normal and everybody hustled. And you know, like the way selling drugs and all that shit look on TV is, it doesn't really mirror reality in a way of the drug deal is not always the young fly dude with the fucking, it's not the young fly black dude who's like innovative and like the smartest guy in his class, fucking Jamal with the highest test score. Like it's not, it's not always the case, you know? And it's not, and he's not always gonna meet the Colombian looking guy with the linen <laughs> pants, fucking drink champagne at fucking two o'clock on a Tuesday. Uh, like that's uh, not always uh, the case. Sometimes, uh. The drug dealer is the FedEx guy who needs to make an extra $250 a week to be able to pay his fucking sprint bill and child support. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the drug dealer is the grandma who has the grandson and she can't fucking keep him from out the streets. So she organizes it and she distributes it through the frozen cups just to make sure her knucklehead grandson stays out of prison. It is very diverse. It is a serious problem. Addiction plagues this country and any and all types of people suffer from that shit. And I grew up in a reality where, yo, okay, yeah, so you know, like like cops used to say, um, this is a um, this is a drug free zone, so you gotta stay out of this, right? And we would be in a school like dog, this is where we live. Yeah. <laughs> like you yeah, put yeah, the yeah. sign in front of my door, yeah, like yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. How in the fuck can I not do that? Yeah. And um, and it's 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 a normalized thing. Um, people lose hope, you know. And when I say lose hope, I don't mean lose hope for success or lose hope to make money, but they lose hope in regards to like some of the traditional career paths that are presented to young children because the people who make money are right in front of you and they're hustling. It's right so there. let's just say if like, oh, and this is why I and we can get into this, but this is why like if I visit a school. Like in, in Baltimore, I visit the schools in Baltimore. I might visit like 10, 15 times in a year because the person who's in the street, they around every day. The influence that's not good or the influence that's trying to, you know, pushing the wrong thing, they got perfect attendance. Straight up. So if you're trying to push something different, then you got to make sure you're pulling up more than just, it's more than a day of service. But the way I came up is um, selling drugs almost felt legal or like normal. It didn't feel like a bad thing. So like, yeah, we're gonna move this way. We're gonna try not to get caught by the cops. But it's not that we're scared of jail. Mm -hmm. We're not scared of prison. Like, yo, fuck that shit. Like, yo, it's part of it. Right. It's not like, oh my God, you know, the system, it's, it's part of it. Like, yeah. it's, it's part of it. Yeah. It's part of the game. It's, yeah. It's part of it. And mind you, you got your, your, you know, you got your people like, you know, oh my God, I can't do it. You know, yeah. John, John sold it. Like you yeah, got, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like you got those, you got those guys. But where I'm from, it was always talked about and presented as like a normal, a normal thing. It was like a normal thing. So um, when I decided to hustle, 
and like I knew how to cook crack. I knew how to cut heroin. I knew how to like I knew not to touch fentanyl because I don't know how to cut fentanyl. I don't know how to cut fentanyl, so I would never touch fentanyl. I would never be like, yo, we gotta get the fent. Yeah. I would never do that because yeah. I know that yo, I would fucking kill two hundred fifty people. Sure. Like I, so I would yeah, never, yeah. I would never do that shit. Yeah. Like, but I've already knew these things. Like I've saw these things. I've saw these things. Like. You know, you're in the house watching the Smurfs and then, you know, a big brother or a big homie or whatever is in the kitchen bagging up and it's yeah. like, yo, go, you know, go get some ice cubes so we can throw the ice in it, whatever. Like we, you know, whatever. And it's like a normal thing. The police are out there and I was just talking with, with, with them. One thing like I'm really just interested in it, and I thought like, you know, your essay really hit upon was just like kind of the currency of violence and like the currency, like what that does for you, what it does for the police force, what it does for you if you're on the street. Yo, it's one part that was, it was a part that was cut out the essay, but I put it in a book. So the guy who we run down on, right, Squeaky, he's Clarence in the book, is was my dad. He's my dad's friend. So I knew him since I was a small wow. child. So it wasn't like, you know, like, can you just name one of your dad's good friends. Uh, Peter. Imagine fucking taking the gun handle and smacking Peter's front yeah, teeth yeah, out, yeah. right? You're like, God damn, like, yo, not Peter. You know what I mean? <laughs> Peter fucking brought the eggnog. Like, so, <laughs> so... When I was a little kid, we had they had this scam where me and my dad would go to the sneaker store, right? Yeah. This is when Air Force Ones first came out. And they fucking first came out and people didn't know Nike like that. And this is like, and it's like, yo, they got fucking air technology inside the soul that make you feel like you like walking on air and shit. Yeah. Made by some astrophysicist people, right? Like, yeah. yo, this shit is like wow. And Baltimore was like the spot that had like the Nike color of the month. So like it was kind of like the beginning of the multiple colorway sneaker culture. Yeah. And Clarence used to say, yo, come in the store, wear some fucked up shoes, take the fucked up shoes off, put them in a box. You take the new shoes, wear them out. I'm going to put the fucked up shoes back in the stock room. You don't go to the register. You put the money in my pocket. Mm -hmm. We good. Mm -hmm. So that was my guy. Straight like he up. kept me right. Yeah. Like I used to find fucked up shoes to go. So that was my guy. So, you know, whatever happened in his life, you know, the sneaker shit ain't work out for obvious reasons. <laughs> so <laughs> he's on a block and he's on a block. And now I caught up in age. So now I'm on a block around the same time he's on a block. And we have this conflict. And, you know, I I'm going to say Nick. You know, it's Gary, but I'm gonna say Nick because of you know to be in line with the piece. I, I I changed that name for a reason. He has a son. You know what I'm saying? And his son is his son is dealing with the consequences of his dad's decisions. And I think about that as a parent too. But Nick, um, I'm telling Nick like, yo, we can't fucking like no, we can work. This is my dog. Like, and he's like, nah, he really not though. Not no more. You're not trading fucked up Pumas for brand new Nikes now. Now, this is like, this is a real problem and it's nothing to talk about. And the crazy thing about it is, is me and is Nick, me and Nick, the balance was so perfect because I'm not what you would call emotional, but I think a lot. And he's really emotional, but he's just all action. So if I'm gonna have like a 10 page plan, he has like a two second solution yeah. and you need that you need because it. without without him, and this is like, you know, even more sad, but without him, I would have been dead a long time ago. Like he's dead now, rest in peace. But without him, I would have been dead because people knew that like, you know, you take a hair off of my head, he's going to take your head off your shoulders. And that was, that's what it was. And I knew that. One who will get you killed is the one who will keep you alive, man. I, I, so dress code came home, who's dressy, but dressy was dress code too. I mean, I changed it, but I didn't because he was both. And when he came home, um, it was it was my turn, and I had to I had to put hands on him because we we in the field every day. Yeah. So I know he ain't gonna touch me. He ain't gonna touch me. He ain't gonna touch me because he's scared of you. But what do you think of me? And that becomes a brand new conversation. So I got to make sure you know I'm about all of this stuff you about, even though I do this other stuff, That's right. I'm about what you about, or you can work me out the situation and it becomes that kind of reality. And it becomes that kind of reality. And you, and you, and you know, and you, you you fight and you you bleed and you get your hands dirty. You you know, sometimes you get your ass whipped. Sometimes you whip ass and... You know, it's it's um, you know, sometimes you need to you need you need that too. You sure. know, like 
you think it, it, it's a complete mirror, like a complete exact mirror, the way that it also works for a lot of these guys on the on the police force? I think that a lot of these guys doesn't mean they're not tough. Doesn't mean they, they can't fight. They can fight. They can do all of these things, but it doesn't really come out. It doesn't come out of them at 12 years old. It doesn't come out of them in the youth jail. It doesn't come out of them their first year of high school. It comes out of them when they get that badge and that gun. And I think um, sometimes proving a point becomes a different thing to them because it's like their first experience in being in like a real gang. Because if you're in a gang gang, then you're not going to get the job. So if you're never in a gang, and then you get with them. It's your first time in a gang, and you got to prove to them right. that you can that you can stand up and you can do that. And I know that on a deeper level because guess what? We never talked about this. My sister is a county cop. She was in her early 20s. She had a baby father that like wasn't really making the bread that she thought he should be making to take care of their family. So she left him and she her whole family's gangsters and she ain't fucking with us, yeah. you know, yeah. and she became a cop. Yeah. And she said that when the bra broke out, you know, black women teamed up with like mostly men um, and it's the county, so it's mostly white men. They looking for her to throw hands, so she had to throw hands, or they don't want to. People don't want to link up with her. Right. And we have these conversations um, because she got some years on the force now, like to the point where she can almost retire. And any argument that's gonna be like the argument that a police officer would make, she's gonna ride with them. Right. She's going to ride against me. She's going to ride against our father. She's going to ride against our cousins. She's going to ride with that perspective because she's deeply entrenched in that culture, right? And that is just, it's, it is necessary. It is necessary for her to have that mentality because even though biologically we are her family, she's not spending 50 hours a week with us. Right. She's spending 50 hours a week with them. Right. So she has to align her thoughts and beliefs have to align with them. And I respect that. And I got, I got, you know, I, I love her daily. Like that's, she's my heart. But when it comes to that conversation, we don't have them. We don't really go deep into the conversations because we don't see the world the same way. Right. Right. Was there one major event? Was it a series of events? Like what gave you to kind of like, kind of put that kind of life behind you and, and uh, to, to kind of dive in fully to be, to be an artist? You know, how fire would it be if I was like, I, I watched The Punisher? That would be the you fucking answer. Like, 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 that's the answer I'm looking for. That's a, but like, the good shit would have been yeah, like, I, I saw you on Law and Order, and I just saw such truth. <laughs> it's like, and the sexiness. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. like you know. It's like, you fucking hanging out with Lieutenant Benson. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yo, the thing for me, so it was like, it was a number of things. Um, the first is, I came of age. I've came up in the streets in the crack era. The crack was dying down. It wasn't the same as it was even, you know, two years after I started, three years after I started, it was different. So that's one of the things. Second thing is, second thing is I, um, I started traveling and I started going to different um, cities and different countries even. And all of a sudden my neighborhood and everything I believed in and subscribed to just felt this big. Wow, yeah. Third thing is um, my best friend, my best friend, Tavon Robinson, had got sentenced to 27 years for nonviolent drug crimes. He came home, he did 16, and um, his sentence, you know, he was able, you know, he was able to come home. Yeah. Um, he did 16 years with the feds. And, um, you know, he, he was at the Hollywood Museum the other day with like, posing with like the wax figures, making jokes and shit. Like, you know, it's all new. He's like, he's home, you yeah. know, like, yeah. he's home and shit. But like, you know, him getting that time was and not having him there with me and then you know Gary with Nick dying and like some other people dying and just the the the, the whole like you know the snowball effect of all of these different things was just like yo do you want to be the guy that's like on the block and you're like 30 years old and all of your good friends are like 18 you know like some Al Bundy high school reminiscing shit you know what I mean like or do you want to do something different with your life and I had um I also had um I got shot and I wasn't running from when I got shot, but 
I had to get like a, a, a procedure done, um, like a piece of slug that was stuck in my bone out. And when I went to go get that done, I'm in the hospital. It's this nurse, right? And um, she was cool. She was like, she wasn't from the neighborhood, but she seemed like she was from the neighborhood, but she was cool. And I've never, ever, ever saw a person with their head stuck in the book like that. So she would come in my room three o'clock in the morning and read, and she have her head deep in the book. And it's not like a lot of shit on the TV. It's like, I mean, you know, it's like MASH and like this show Mama's Family. You heard of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a mom and her family. Yeah, yeah. So like it's shit like that on the TV. And it's cool, but you can't watch it for like 30 hours. Yeah, yeah. And she would come in with this book and I'm like, yo, damn, that must be a good book. And she's like, yo, you would like that book. And I was like, no, nah, I don't fuck with no book. And she's like, what the last, the last time you read a book? Yeah. And I was like, oh no, I read a book recently. So what you read? I said, 48 Laws of Power. She said, nigga, you didn't read that shit. I said, I know, I did. <laughs> well, everybody who tell you they read that book, they never read it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's actually not that bad, but it's like... What book did she have? So she had a book called The Coldest Winter Ever and by Sister Soldier. And we made some jokes about it. And she's like, yo, you would really like this book. And I'm like, yo, why would I like this book? She said, because it's about you and your friends. I said, me and my friends. She said, yeah, it's about thugs. I said, Man, I ain't no thug. She said... Everybody who visits you smell like a bunch of weed, even the old people. And I was like, duh, they got cataracts. And, and she's like, she started laughing and shit. And then she rolls out. She left the book. So I woke up three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning and picked the book up and started thumbing through the pages. And I'm like, damn, I never knew you could write a book like that. Yeah. And I never saw her again. And like, I went home and I'm like, yo, what else Sister Soldier write? So now I'm reading all of her shit. So I'm like, damn, yo, when she got interviews, oh, she mentioned this lady, Zora Neely Hurston. What's she write about? Oh, Toni Morrison. Well, let me read that. James Baldwin. Oh, he was alive around the same time as the beatnik, uh, the beatnik. So let me read On the Road and Naked Lunch. And what the fuck are they talking about? Oh, so who's this guy that was referenced? Fyodor Dostoevsky. Oh, so now I'm sitting on Ashland Avenue reading a fucking idiot. <laughs> and my homie like, yo, what is the idiot about? It's a dude who fuck his life up over girls, just like your dumb ass. You know? like, so <laughs> now I'm in, like I'm, yeah. knee, I'm, I'm knee deep in literature and I've tapped into some whole other shit fuck that yeah. I've never even knew I cared about because I got that one book. Yeah. And um, I was already in a transition in my life. I was in college, but I wasn't a reader. I was there and I was like, yo, I'm gonna go to school for criminal justice and I don't even fucking know what to do with that shit. Like, but I just didn't know because I didn't know anybody went to college. Yeah. So I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Once I got that book, I'm like, oh no, nah, fuck that. I want to write. And then um, I started reading like a lot of articles and I'm like, yo, a lot of these reporters are full of shit. Like, because they're quoting people in these articles and I'm like, yo, we, we don't even talk like that. Like, you didn't, nobody said that shit. Yeah. Like, yeah. and one thing I've learned in all the studying and reading is that the best form of critique is creation. You don't like it, contribute. So that's okay. when I threw my hat in the ring and start like trying to publish and get down with like publications and and get my stuff out there. And um, and it took a while, but when I got it, I got like the first essay I, I wrote that click um, back in 2014. That's when I first came across Dave. David first email hit me up and reached out and was like, I know these voices. I know these people, kid. You got something. Fuck yeah. David Simon. I'm like, man, this ain't no fucking David Simon. So I hit back. You David Simon? Fuck. You David Simon? Fuck. Where you at? I'm coming get some money. Yeah. What, we, what, 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 what we working on? Yeah, yeah. And we met up and then he sent me out to go like work with a couple of different people on some projects, but the projects never really came together. But I started building that relationship and... um. And yeah, you know. Just... Tell me a little bit about your process. Like, I know you like to write at night and shit like that, but like, do you feel like you're, does it flow out of you? Does it, like, is it come, like, just it, d describe what it feels like for you. So, it normally starts with an idea. And then I always, always, always ask myself, why? I always ask myself, why? Why are you doing this? Why? And I see so many whys. I see so many whys, but they just have to be organized and amplified to be able to connect to like the bigger, the bigger picture. And does the why for you, does the why for you help you with your process or does it settle something in your heart that says, okay, this is now, uh, th this now anoints me with something pure enough that, 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 that this is worth my time. 
everything isn't righteous, but everything that I've been lucky enough and blessed enough to work on up until this moment has been necessary. Fuck yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. because righteous is such a such a personal, it's a personal thing. You're like, the only one who can answer it. Some shit might be righteous to him, but I might be like, yo, man, I don't feel like watching the fucking office. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I yeah, fuck yeah, with yeah. the office, but <laughs> yeah, 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 I yeah, fuck yeah. with the office, but I'm yeah, not, yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. righteous. So, yeah. but it but it is though. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like I don't kind of look at it like that, but I I I I more so look at it through the lens of um things that I think are meaningful based on the people who I've been lucky enough to interact with. One of the things you and I also first connected on, it's like somebody can come at something with something that fucking has deep fucking meaning for them, man, that they really, really care about. But then they hand that over or they get marginalized within the process very fast because there's people who have been there before, people who know more or people. And then it just becomes something else and fit into a box of familiarity and I think familiarity is like a huge huge enemy in this shit man like you gotta steer clear from that like write the fucking truth write your truth and you gotta eliminate I think so many of the middlemen I mean you just you can't have middlemen in this thing you just can't we can talk about attentions we can talk about people that have good hearts we can talk about people that have that want to do the right thing mm -hmm. and we can't demonize them for that however we can still demonize the system in the, in the way that they chose to exercise that action without calling them bad people or picking them apart. These are the problems that exist. It's like shit that has just been in line before all of us were born. Yeah. And we're chasing that. And we're trying to solve it using the same thing that we've been trying to use for hundreds of years and the shit just doesn't really work. And it's not even a response, it's not even their responsibility to understand that shit. So it's kind of like we can't even judge them <laughs> the way that a lot of them are judged because they don't even have the experience, the skill set, or the insight to really understand 100%. that. 100%. But they do have a skill set and insight that is valuable based on the lives that they led, and that shit is valuable Thanks, too. Man. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, even like if you talk about the show that we just worked on, yeah. no writer in the history of fucking writing has ever articulated the problem with society, politicians, police officer, and culture better than David did in the book, The Corner. The book, The Corner, is so fucking nuanced that like a person with a limited amount of reading comprehension could pick that book up and understand why shit doesn't work. Why the shit that we do doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. How he remains optimistic after writing that is some wild shit, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> it's some it's some it's some wild shit. But it's a perfect example of when we talk about what that why is, and the why for me and and what I see in a lot of projects, a lot of things that I work on, it becomes just 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 this whole idea of let's hold a mirror up and let's just identify what's happening. And let's show why these things play out the way they play out. But let's be entertaining and let's be fun and let's let's get into some shit. Let's get dirty, but at the same time, let's tell some real. Let's tell the hard truth. What's the entertaining, fun, dirty part? Like why? One of the things that has been really successful for me is getting my books into schools. When I came into it, I'm like, schools and jails. Why schools and jails? Because the book of it is gonna sell fucking 60 copies. 100. The school event is gonna sell 1,500, 2,000. I'm not a New York Times bestseller because I got a fucking sweater yeah. and fucking, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Dress socks and church socks and shit. Yeah. I'm a New York Times bestseller because I burnt the schools down, yeah. right? But the secret to burning the schools down is you trick them into learning. So I can dangle the street shit in front of your face, but I can give you the why, the lessons of where it came from. I can put it in historical context. I can tell you why it doesn't work, and I can plant something in you to let you know why it won't work for you. Fuck yeah. Because it hasn't worked for people who were tougher and smart. Like, people who are tougher and smarter than me, it didn't work for. But also, because you've been there. Like, you ain't been there, you, been can't, there. you can't, yeah, yeah. What yeah. love? So yeah. I can entertain you with the shit that you're entertained by. Right. 
But at the same time, I can give you the why yeah. you don't need to take this route. That's right. And this fuck it has been proven. It's been proven. It's it hasn't worked like it hasn't changed the world, but it changed a lot of lives, which is changing the world, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One person being delivered is like fucking changing the world. Crazy. You never right? know what they're gonna you never know what they're gonna go on to do. You know, when I, when I kind of like changed and said, okay, I'm going to devote my life to my work and to my family. I'm going to trim a bunch of the fat off of my life. I felt like there was also this big fucking hole in me, man. Like I felt like I had this like big emptiness, especially behavior wise, because there was always a pattern of behavior I would always do. I was always this guy to my friends. I was, oh, I only know. But now since I've given all that shit up, I was on my own and I didn't know what to fill it with. And I guess like what you talk about, like being delivered. And when you first came out that shit, did you feel like it was good or did you think it was trash? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really know, but I felt right. I didn't felt know, but felt it, right felt, it, it felt right. Felt it right felt doing right it. doing it. I felt like I was a person to tell the stories that I was telling. I felt like there was nobody better, but it's kind of hard to gauge it if you don't have, and it's crazy because I would never tell a young artist to base their 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 skill set and, and their belief on industry validation. On like accolades and shit. But that kind of that shit pays the bills. So it's like that shit pays the bills. Have you had rejection as a writer? Oh fuck yeah. Dang. Yo, you hear some crazy some wild shit. I actually keep that shit. So I have like 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 a shoebox full of rejection letters at home. And then I have like a list with the names of people that rejected me just so I can never forget that shit. Fuck yeah. And I know it's sick and toxic and kind of like know, fucked I'm the up, same way, dude. But I just feel like I need to know. You know what I mean? Nah, and yeah. it took my agent, it took me over a year to get an agent. Then it took my agent like another two or three years to sell my first book. And like, it's, it's, it's funny because before she was a literary agent, Barbara, she actually was a stand-up comedian. Wow. So the fact that she can't sell my shit and she's also funny, yeah. it's like makes the shit like even more funny. But at the time when I was writing these books, um, nobody was interested in the guy ex drug dealer redemption makes it the Johns Hopkins University redemption story. That shit wasn't it wasn't hitting back then. It's more hitting now, but it wasn't hitting back then. We're judging based on the checking of boxes more than we're judging based on the quality of the art. That's right. And that shit is why a lot of shit that you probably came across on television and film is bullshit. It's not about it's not about check it's not about putting the motherfucker on because of who they what they look like or who they are. And it's not about putting the motherfucker on so you can look diverse. It's about how do we get to the best fucking art? Right. I care about the best art. That's what I care about. And I'm going to stand on that shit. I'm going to live by that shit. And I'm going to die by that shit. And the industry for a long time has not benefited me. But I still, I stand on, I'm going to work. Like, that's why I said, I'll keep going back to this. Your success is obvious, but who you were as a person when I first talked to you outweighed all of that shit. It just, it don't mean, like, because all of the other shit, it don't mean nothing. Like, you know what I mean? Like... It just don't mean anything, but I'm like, yo, you get it. So we can we can fucking rock and roll, and that's the game. There's a woke culture going on right now where people have a certain access to a certain type of like knowledge and ideas, and they don't use it to uplift people. They use it to demonize people who don't quite understand, and that's my biggest problem with that shit. So if a motherfucker don't know, you're not saying, look, I'm woke, so let me explain this shit to you. You're saying, you don't know what this means? You don't know what that means? You don't know this? You don't know that? You, let's cancel you. And it's like, yo, let's enlighten each other. Let's, let's, let's share the knowledge. Let's show some love. Let's, let's build a stronger community. Let's not, let's not be torn down and then in turn you know, be oppressed and then dream of being a little oppressor yourself. That's right. <laughs> let's That's fucking right. That's right. That's right. deal with the let's let's deal with the oppression and utilize that shit to uplift motherfuckers so that we can be an army and a family and a unit. And it's just not happening. It's being it's a competition to like who has access to the most fucking like you know. <laughs> you know like that mean? shit like, can be like I don't know, man. I think also yo, but though, racism. Why the fuck was my cup so little? Yeah, that's like, yo, racism, you got a bigger dog. cup. You yeah, got yeah, a bigger cup. This is yo, like and I them, got and I got a fancy ass cube, dog. I yo, this is, this is like one of them cubes. cups that they eat the fucking softball <laughs> egg out of. 
the fucking soft bowl ostrich egg. This is one of them fucking egg cups. Like, he came here with this little shit. <laughs> I ain't gonna no blunt. <laughs> yeah, we gotta spark this one right now, dude. We gotta spark this one now. We but should I'm... march. We should fucking march. We should fucking like. I should organize a march around this little ass cup. <laughs> That's a crazy shit, though, because I think that stuff, man, I don't know, man. I, I, I just, uh, I think that shit can be really dangerous, too, man. Motherfuckers speaking for people. You, you, you know, it's like... Um, Especially when you don't talk to the people you're speaking for. That's what I'm saying. You, you don't know? talk to them. That's right. How you know what the fuck they want? What, the, what are you How you know about? what the fuck they want? That's right. Yo, a dude who I respect, I ain't gonna say his name. I respect this dude. I respect this dude. And we was in fucking, we was in the UK. We was hanging out with the dude who I told you about, who was who stole a piece of my writing. Mm -hmm. We went, to, I went to London with him, one of his events early on and shit, right? And we hanging out with this dude I respect, big name poet and shit. And we sitting in the green room, they about to go on stage, right? And this dude was like, he's a black dude. He was like, as a you know, we don't we don't want reparations, we want free education. And I look like. Motherfucker, I don't want free education. I want a motherfucking check. Like, what the yeah, fuck yeah, make yeah. you think you can tell me what I want? Yeah. We don't just want money. We want yeah. free school. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get free classes of philosophy 102 to talk about Descartes and shit. Yeah, 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 I want to yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. talk about Descartes. Oh, yeah. I want some, yeah, <laughs> I want some, yeah. some fucking Gucci, nigga. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. the fuck <laughs> is you talking about? Like, I want some drip. Like, I don't want that. But how do you feel so comfortable saying that? With, with your chest poked out and your chin up, what if I went to college for free already? I had free college. So if I had free college, I don't get the check? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've, I've, ex I've enjoyed that. Yeah. I went to bread, dog. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. how can you say that yeah. with a straight face and they're going to listen to you more than listen to me because you're, you're world famous. Right up in there. Right up in there. You know what I'm saying? It's, it, it, it's dangerous shit. And when you talk about... You talk you know, I found that. I mean, even like when we get when we talking about that police thing. I mean, what's what 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 was your take on that on that whole movement on the defund movement and all that? Like, you, you know, like saying, you, you know, obviously my biggest connection, you know, my biggest connection now is in Shreveport, and I look at what's going on in that city and I look at all the violence, and you know, man, it's like th that shit has. Uh, that shit has caused real problems down there, man. Yo, unpopular opinion. I'm gonna tell you some shit that you might not never hear in this era. That you might not never hear anybody say. I'm actually unqualified to speak on that shit. <laughs> Yo, I don't have the qualifications to speak on it because I can say defund police all day, but I have guns. I fucking like my wife and my daughter, they're in a gated community. Straight up. Like, if you disrespect my wife or my daughter, I will find you. Come I'm on your that. ass. I can say that. Everybody doesn't have that. There's like, you can go to like, you know, I got family all through Baltimore City in some of the worst neighborhoods in the country. And I people in my family who would be like, yo, I, I called the police to clear the corner. I, I didn't want the people selling drugs on my corner, on in front of my house. Am I to demonize them? Because if something happens, I know I'm not going to be the one to pull up and be like, hey, guys, 10-4, 34-62-7, you need to clear the corner. Yeah, like, yeah. I know I'm not going to be that guy. Yeah. And the co the conversation is way more complex than people have made it on the internet. 100%. So just because I don't fuck with the police, I don't have to call them, I don't have to deal with them unless I need an insurance report, doesn't mean that another person hasn't had an experience where they felt like they were helped by them. But so I would never get on a public platform and take a hard stance because I'm not now. If I if you were asking me about reform and what that looks like, I do think we need a unit of um, unarmed officers to handle disputes or insurance claims or nonviolent conflicts or traffic stops. I think. The key in maintaining the order could potentially be disarming a, a large segment or, or disarming a large segment and sending them off to get some type of training 
to be able to have like the social worker type of skills to deal with conflict. And the, but that would be secondary. The primary thing to do would be um, having it be a requirement to live in a city if you're gonna police in that city. No more living in Pennsylvania. No right. more Ooh, living in no, all that shit. Fuck all that shit. Living, living in a you don't gotta live in a neighborhood where you work, but live in a neighborhood that mirrors the neighborhood you work in, so you can get a clear understanding of the people. <clears throat> then we can start having real conversations. Then we can start dealing with conflict in a way that is um, that would be nonviolent. What, what do you see like five years from now? Like, what do you want, man? Ten TV shows on running at the same time. Straight up. Why TV is t- why, why? Why do you feel like TV is your medium? Because I don't know if I have the skill set to tell a story in 120 minutes. Because there's always so much more. All of my favorite books, everything that I read, everything that I'm into always goes into perspective the perspective of different people. You take a film that I really, I really enjoy, like King Richard, but you want to go home with some of the trainers. You want to go home with some of, of the other kids. Yeah, yeah. You want to go home with different. You want to go home with different Straight people. Up. You want to see what other little tennis athletes live like yep, yep, in comparison yep. to the Williams sisters. Then you get like a bigger picture of how perspective, perspective, powerful perspective. that fucking story was. Beautiful. And you can do that shit in three hours. Yeah. It's a little more difficult to yep. do it, you know. Well, well, also, it's like life, man. Like, the thing that's so dope about TV when it really fucking works, and I've really only had this experience, like, once, but it's, there's a fluid relationship between the show and the writer. The people that are making the show with the words and the people that are making the shows with the acting and the, and the, and, and the crew... They're working off of each other. So the writers can watch the show. They can see what you're doing. They can say, hey, man, I see which way you're going. I'm going to write for that. I see what you're doing. I'm going to write for that. It can be continual. It can can continue to be inspirational. Rather than I'm going to shoot something, I'm going to finish it, and it kind of is what it is. I mean, I know I can write a film. Like, I've written, like, I've written, they've never been made, but, like, I've written that shit before. And the, the, the medium of television is just... It just, it fits me. So, and I'm talking about like, we can do some shit that's going to run for five, like, you know, five seasons, or we can do like mini series that's going to be like 10 episodes. Right. Or, I mean, even, I was kind of, I kind of, I wanted We Own a City to be 10. I thought we could have did 10. There's so much I, more, bro. I thought we could have so did. So much more. I, I see that that documentary. I see the pseudo doc, dog. It's like, dude, there's so, I mean, and that was the thing, like for me, it was so, that part of the process was so painful because man, like I dug in, man. Like I seen so, like this city is like my heart now, dude. Like I love this, I, I, there are so many people I love. And like, I'm like, I'm hearing this shit. I'm like, yo, this scene, this, and I'm constantly pitching scenes. I'm constantly like, yo, what about, yo. it's so big, man. Yo, we didn't go home with Shopshire, bro. That's he, so Shopshire was Gondor's homeboy. He's in federal prison right now. I be talking to him. Yeah. I be talking to him. He's like the main, like the main, he's the main drug dealer yeah. that kind of sparked this whole shit off. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, we yeah. didn't go home with Shopshire. We didn't go home with yeah. Gondo. Yeah. We didn't go home with fucking Moose. Yeah, whose yeah, story yeah, 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 got yeah, yeah. national fucking attention. Totally. We didn't go home with him. Totally. And we got into some fights. Was there ever any talk about that? Did you guys ever? My situation was tricky because. I'm I'm a I'm a student of David and I'm a student of George. So my perspective, I definitely felt like it was super valued. I felt super appreciated and super valued, but I also understood my role. And my role was the was the listen and learn. Yep. That was my role. My role. So I didn't even know I was gonna get an episode coming in. Coming in, I was like supposed to just be in the room taking notes and just listening and just providing like facts and like things based on my research and stuff like that. From my understanding, I didn't know. So when David was like giving out the episodes and George was giving out the episodes, I didn't know they was gonna be like, oh yeah, you got three by yourself. Like I didn't know that was coming. Mm-hmm. So I was ready for it, but I didn't know. So I do think the elements that they chose to include were extremely important, but I'm also greedy. And I'm greedy in a way that I wanted 10, I wanted 10, I wanted 10 hours over the six. And and, and as a student, 
I also need to learn how to deal with a network, how to talk to a network about that, how to explain that, what that means and what that looks like. Yo, I think like from what I saw, I think y'all killed that shit. Like I was in awe just watching everybody work and it energized me to be able to say, well, how can you get in a position where you can create something that that, that duplicates this feeling? But I, but in all, I don't get in the position I was in if I don't respect the game. And there's so many people that don't respect the game. It's like I got into an argument with a guy the other day because they were talking about um, HBO wanted this book, but they didn't want the other book and this, that, and the third. And I, the person who said it, I didn't press down on him. I press down on a person who know that's a fucking lie mm. and let that lie linger. Mm, 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 Why mm. are you letting this lie linger mm, and you mm, know mm. that you sold the rights to your shit to somebody else? Mm, Why mm. do you ain't say that when mm. you can say that? Mm. Because he was going to buy both and he was going to give you guys positions wow. to be able to be storytellers and you you, wow. you took yourselves out of that conversation. Is that right? That's crazy. That's at 2,000% Wow, right. wow. Because I was there. Yeah. I was there. In this city, as far as that show is concerned, do you feel like there's like two, like almost two political camps? There's like a camp that's with We Own the City and there's one with I Got a Monster. Like, do you feel like- Absolutely. And like, what? how do you describe those two camps? I think, so, and this is like, this is, it's, it makes me upset because I have like a lot of people I respect and got love for across the board. And- I think that Justin has an extremely important perspective that needs to be in existence because when the case was going on, nine out of 10 motherfuckers who was getting that information was trusting the information they got from Justin. And you and you're not bring, you're not you're not even having a conversation without the work that he's put out in the world. Like him, don't like him, whatever your so stance Justin, is. So Justin, the Baltimore son, like him, the Baltimore, career, Baltimore the ba- son, the Baltimore, every Baltimore, motherfuckers trusted him on this Talking to 20, 2021, going back to when I was born, the Baltimore son has been Baltimore's newspaper. It just is. It's where David Just, Simon comes from, right? That's where Simon comes yeah. from. Justin Fitton is the crime reporter. And the information you are getting and that you are tweeting about, and the articles you are sharing, and the person who you are referencing is fitting in his reporting. I have a close relationship with Baynard Woods, who wrote who I, wrote, got, a I monster. got a Monster. Yeah. And like, you know, like I know, I'm cool with Brandon Soderbergh too, but me and Baynard are actually friends. And Baynard is an excellent writer, That's excellent. A book, he's an excellent researcher. He's fucking like, he's the best at what he does. Like, he he's taken my shit and picked it apart, and like, gave me versions to help me become better. I got love for him. So if it's going to come down to who I'm going to work with, like I, Fit, Fit is a great guy. We're cool, but Baynard is my actual, that's my dog. So if we're going to have a real conversation, we're not like, and, and David knows Baynard's work. So David was like, yo, I was going to get, I was going to buy both books. That's what he said. He said, I couldn't because they sold their rights already. So mm. I couldn't do nothing with it. Mm. So if you, you can't sit here and be like, oh, HBO only wants to do this. No. But I like what I like what we put together. I like this. I mean, I, I like the ideas we came up with. I like the arguments. I like what I learned. I like um the debates. You know what I'm saying? Like in the perfect world, we would be able to go home with more of the cops. You know what I'm saying? But also the story of Wayne Jenkins is a Maybe we need to zero in on that. You know, like was was what, home? Was zero in, we zero in on Wayne. And I think that is something that we so with Sonya's documentary, Sonya could have did a deep dive into the gun trace task force. She 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 talked to Wayne a bunch, right? She she had connections. Sonya chose to focus on Sean, Suda. which is dope. But imagine how she wouldn't be able to focus on him and his family if she tried to tell the if she tried to go home because I, I knew I knew some of Gondo's girlfriends that I was able to plug her with. Yeah. I knew like 
um, I had Shooter's first wife. Like I had, I had mm-hmm. a collection of people from my own research and conversations yeah. that I was able to plug her with. Broadening, right? It was all about like you, you, you know, you were like, you knew this, you knew this, you knew it, so you did this. You were like doing that thing, and you excelled in that thing. But then, like every step of the way, it was about broadening. It was like, and then you saw this, and you said, then you the, the book, then the college, then like it was like just kind of like, bro- and every time you broadened. You know, you've just gotten wiser and better and more healthy and found more peace of mind, which are like closer to your truth. That's what it it seems like to me. I think like we have a truth. You got to be connected. Like if you want to be happy, you got to be true. You got to be authentic. If you're not that, like you're all like faking it, you'll always be miserable. That's why like punk asses who talk too loud, can't do shit. It's like they're miserable. That's why they're talking too loud. Cause that's not who they are, right? What the fuck am I gonna do in LA? Just work in writers' rooms and make shows and shit? Like no, I man. I mean, when I can like go to a park, like what the fuck do I look? What man, I, do? I mean, first of all, it's like first of all, it's like. I like, mean, I'm not against parks and shit like them parks. Well, are, you gotta like think about. Yeah, them shit like, like, like these are some cool. LA motherfuckers. Look, look, the bottom oh, y'all line. Live in LA? Yeah, all these guys. What the guys. fuck y'all be doing like on a regular? Dude, dude, dude. You want you can be fucking outside, bro. I'm like, I hate to say it. I love DC with every bit of my body, dude. I'm DC like like I love DC. Yo, man, the East Coast is some fucking trash compared to the West Coast. Man. Uh, it's, it's just a, fucking yo, trash. The East Coast dude. is trash. It's shit like 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 I hate to say it. I hate to say it, but like, dude, it's just when you go live out there, you're like, yo, I love that I grew up here, but like I don't need to ever live there again. Ever, (laughs) ever, 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 ever. Thanks for being here, everybody. I really appreciate it. If you dug what you saw and you want to hear more, subscribe, like, do all that stuff. Uh, It'd mean a lot to us. I hope you dig these episodes as much as we dig doing them. You guys take care of yourself.